BBC Radio York. Coming up after the news. It was a project that took several years for a, a young Jewish eye doctor in uh, what is now part of Poland um, who grew up in, a, in a, an environment where there were four different language groups and they couldn't agree. you find out what Ian Carter is talking about in around about ten minutes' time on the programme. Well, actually, I'll tell you. It's the language Esperanto, which was meant to be a special, unique, universal language that would let people who didn't speak one another's languages communicate. The question the question is, what's happened to it? Is it still going strong? Ian will tell us more in a few minutes. So, coming up in a few minutes, whatever happens to Esperanto, the language that people were taught once upon a time, so that people who didn't actually speak one another's languages could communicate. Is it still going strong? We talked about it on the show the other week. We'll be hearing from an expert in a few minutes' time. Coming up in a moment or two, Chuvi Parolas Esperanto? The chances are probably not. Find out more in just a moment. Eight minutes past ten of a Wednesday morning. It's Jonathan Cowp. Through till noon today. So Chuvi Parolas Esperanto? And as I say, the answer is probably not these days. Uh, you might remember we were chatting on the show the other week about whether or not someone who wants to live and work in Britain should have to learn English. You might remember that David Cameron said he was setting aside, I think it was £20 million, to give English language lessons to Muslim women who can't or find it difficult to communicate in English. And as part of that discussion, we ended up talking about uh, language languages in general and whether British people, for example, who go to live abroad have the same duty to learn to speak French or Italian or German or Greek, Spanish or the native language of whichever country they decide to go to. And this brought up the subject of Esperanto, a universal sort of made-up language that at one time was taught in some schools and had some popularity. Whatever became of it? Well, Ian Carter is from the Esperanto Association of Britain. He dropped by our Sheffield studio the other day and he's been telling me all about Esperanto. It was a project that took several years for a, a young Jewish eye doctor in uh, what is now part of Poland um, who grew up in, a, in a, an environment where there were four different language groups and they couldn't agree with each other and he started toying with the idea of uh, some kind of intermediary language that they could all learn uh, so that they could communicate and stop fighting each other and he tried the idea of latin and greek and you know what what do you call a helicopter in latin and, well i don't suppose they had helicopters when <laughs> when the language came out but you know i mean if you take on an existing language, you've got all kinds of problems with vocabulary. How would you would you say internet in ancient Greek? You know, um, it just doesn't work. It would be a bit of a problem, wouldn't it? It would. I should think the email's a bit slower than it is these days as well. <laughs> um, but anyway. So this this was this chap called Zamenhof. That was him, uh, L. L. Zamenhof, and he put out his first little booklet under a pseudonym. Uh, in 1887 because he depended on his practice as a doctor to earn him a living and he thought if I put this out in my own name people are going to think I'm a crank and I'm not going to get any more patients which is you know quite a, a reasonable thing to think I think for the time and he put this booklet out which his father-in-law paid for and it was suddenly taken up by loads of I suppose quite idealistic people in Russia, Poland and that kind of area and it was, it was very enthusiastically received by all the people who had got a copy of this thing. And it eventually made its way to England in um, Keithley, I think it was um, <laughs> first introduced. Yeah. It's, a, it's the most unlikely places, really. Oh, um, well, yeah, tell me about it. I'm from <laughs> Chesterfield. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard people speak about Esperanto. Not even since we had our phone in the other day and suddenly somebody else raised the subject. I've not really heard of Esperanto for years. Is it still going? It certainly is. Um, in fact, there's a very reassuring movement among young people now taking up, uh, not exclusively young people, I have to say, but taking up the language through a, a website and a phone app called Duolingo. I said that with a very English accent, didn't I? You did. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come on to the business of accents in a minute. <laughs> yeah. But Duolingo is fantastic. I've been through ten levels in it and got a trophy on the phone. Um, but then, you know, I've got a bit of an advantage. I've been speaking Esperanto since 1966, I think. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Guilty. How, how did you get into it? Uh, Chesterfield Library is a lot to uh, answer for. Um, I was... Going through the, the language section in Chesterfield Library, as it was in those days, and um, 
I was obsessed with counting in different languages because my dad used to come home from work and, he, and he'd start saying things in Hindustani because he was in, in India during the war. And, you know, he would say things like, pass the bread and what time is it? And, and he would go through the numbers. And I thought, right, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to get dozens of languages and I'm going to learn how to say one to 20 or whatever. And as I worked my way through the through the the pile of books, up came Esperanto, teach yourself Esperanto, blue and yellow binding, and remember it now vividly. Um, and I took it off the shelf and found the page with the numbers on, and I thought, cool, that's easy. And I just borrowed the book, took it home, kept renewing it, and after three months I'd finished it, and I was virtually fluent in Esperanto. You must be the only person to ever take one of those teach yourself books off the <laughs> shelf. I can't remember how many date stamps there were Actually, in it. But... Did the library not just give you the copy after a while? <laughs> Here, come on, kid, have it. Nobody else wants it. No, well, you know, I had to leave it in case somebody's guide dog needed it for some reason. But, um... How many people around? I mean, you know, in the UK at the moment, does anybody oh, know or around the world how many people speak? Is there any way you can go to and be absolutely certain of meeting another Esperanto speaker? Not to be absolutely certain, no, but the thing you can do is is find out from the World Esperanto Association where uh, the Esperantists are in the area you're planning to travel to, make contact with them in advance, and then you can, you know, they'll meet you at the airport, they'll take you home, look after you for a couple of days, feed you, you know. Uh, there was a young girl who, who travelled for 18 months and only paid for three nights accommodation. Um, all through using Esperanto. But she had to plan the the journey in advance. That's marvellous. It, oh, yeah. I'm very envious. Chini povas audi kion Esperanto sonas? Tre bone. Yes, vi bone pronunzas. I had to get that off the internet, although I did learn a little bit of Esperanto as a kid. I think that means, can we hear what Esperanto sounds, sounds like? like? Yes. Um, and that was my attempt at it. Um, it was very good, actually. Was it? I mean, Thank you. Y- yes, I mean, you, you find a lot of English people go down the road of me, estas, esperantisto, you know, and you think, oh, goodness me, put your head in a bucket. And it's just, it, that's not how it's supposed to be. It's much more like Italian or Spanish. So, me, estas, esperantisto. Esperantisto is, I am an Esperantist. Where do the words come from? I mean, this this was must have been Zamenhof's great dilemma when he started out. It was finding words that were recognisable, I suppose, to as many people as possible without it actually being either Spanish or French or German or Greek or Italian. That's right. I mean, there's a, a, a huge proportion of the uh, vocabulary comes from Romance languages, French, Latin, Spanish, Italian. Uh, but there's also a fair proportion from Slavic languages. Uh, and and I was reading an article the other day, uh, which I, I felt I just had to share on Scribd.com or Scribd, however you pronounce it, which was about, uh, by a, a former translator from the United Nations who was comparing Esperanto to Chinese. He was actually Swiss and fluent in Chinese and a number of other languages. And he was pointing out that uh, in Esperanto, what we think of as word endings are not really word endings, they're independent elements, but we tend to stick them together to, so that they look like recognisable words. Um, and I thought, well, that's an interesting concept, the fact that you're not actually learning a word with an ending. You're learning two words, which you can then put together in any number of ways, like a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, well, I think Zamenhof's genius, although I, yeah, everybody says, you know, he's a genius, he was the master and the maestro and all this kind of stuff, was seeing beyond the, the other projects that had gone on at the time for an international language and had fallen foul, if you like, of the uh, let's be cod Latin. Um, so the, 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 he wasn't the only one, then? Oh, gosh, no, it goes back centuries to people like Leibniz and uh, uh, Descartes, philosophers like that. Some of them actually tried to create a language that worked a bit like Roger's thesaurus, where you categorise things and you have A meaning something and then AA meaning something else and AAA. But, of course, you can't pronounce... That must have been a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, nobody ever took it up. There was a project as well called uh, Sol Re Sol, which was based on the tonic sol fa, so that people could sing words to each other. That would have been fun! Well, I've bought a book on it. I went to the World Congress in Lille in France in um, July, uh, and there was this modern pamphlet about sol race. I thought, I've got to get that. I've got to get that. I love that. Can you imagine if there was a sung language? Good morning, welcome to BBC Radio York. 
Ian is just a, an absolute treasure house of knowledge. I love the idea of him as a kid thinking, hang on a minute, Dad, you're not getting away with speaking whatever it was, Hindustani or something at, um, at breakfast, saying pass the toast. Um, I am going to outdo you. I'm going to learn to count in all these different world languages. And that's how he came across Esperanto, a copy of Teach Yourself Esperanto on the library shelf. It does make me wonder... What did you learn from a Teach Yourself book? I had umpteen of them as a kid. You know, high hopes, as you have when you were a youngster, and you think, oh, I'll learn something from a Teach Yourself book. And I don't think I ever did, because I don't think I ever got past page 23, because they were so complicated. But, well, Ian Carter, who you're hearing at the moment from the Esperanto Association of Britain, um, speaking to me the other day from our Sheffield studio, he learnt Esperanto. And by the sound of it, it's been a lifelong passion. I think he had a brief break away from it when he was teaching in the Middle East once upon a time. But he's back with it now, and he'll tell us a little more about Esperanto in a minute or two's time. If you've had your own brush with this language across the course of the years, um, and you've got a tale to tell about it, as one or two people did when it got mentioned on the show the other day, then call me. It's 0190. 641641 or text to 81333. Ah, the mighty share of Gypsies, Tramps and Thieves on BBC Radio. We'll be back with Ian Carter for a little more about uh, this strange, extraordinary language, which is still alive and well, uh, called Esperanto in a moment or two's time. Uh, let's hear a little more from Ian Carter, uh, um, who is an expert Esperantist, and that awkward business that even though Esperanto is meant to be a universal language without, of course, any particular home country, because there isn't one, uh, people of different nationalities do tend to pronounce it with their own national accents. Generally speaking, people get past that very quickly. Um, the French tend to have quite a strong um, Gallic accent, if you like. But uh, I had lunch at the conference in July with a lady from Japan and another lady from South Korea, and we were talking as if we'd known each other for ages. It was really nice. And you don't speak Japanese. I certainly don't. You don't speak Korean. No. And you can communicate around a table. Absolutely, yes. In in fine detail, or is it just... Pleasant niceties. And no, you can talk about philo philosophical stuff, you can talk about political stuff. I had a conversation with somebody about uh, the Brexit kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Why is um, it not taken off then, Ian? Why is it not? I mean, you know, on the face of it, it's absolutely logical that we should we should do this. What, why, why isn't it the, 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 the great well, this lingua franca of the world? It's money, basically. Uh, if you think about English teaching around the world, the British Council puts billions of pounds into that every year. So does the American State Department. Uh, the French have the Alliance Française, um, and all that money is pumped in to make sure that teaching takes place. Nobody puts any money into Esperanto, unless they leave money when they die, which happens quite a bit. Um, but it's just, there's no political clout behind it. So is it nationalism then? Is it different countries like the English-speaking countries want English to be oh, well, yeah. the language and French-speaking countries want French to be the language? Everybody says, you know, you can go all around the world and everybody will understand English. If you try that beyond I'll have two pints of lager, please, um, <laughs> you're going to get stuck, aren't you? You're not going to be able to talk about whether Britain should stay in the, in the EU or not with a waiter in a uh, Yugoslavian hotel for example you're just plucking stuff out of thin air um there's no money behind it there's no political will although interestingly george soros who's at the davos meeting at the moment um was an esperantist when he was a, a refugee from hungary or somewhere like that uh, but he's kind of gone quiet about it. Why is it that the home of British Esperanto seems to be where it is? I mean, you're speaking now from our Sheffield studio. There seems to be a big focus of Esperanto around Stoke and the Midlands and the Sheffield area. Uh, you, why is that? Well, the Stoke area had a very enthusiastic alderman, uh, Alderman Barks, Horace Barks, I think his name was, who was responsible for the Green Star pub. Um, getting that off the ground. Well, I, well, I have had a pint, I should say, in years gone by. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> That's better than me, then. I, I got it down to Esperanto House in, in Barliston, uh, not far from Stoke. It's very thriving down there, but, of course, before it was in Barliston, it was in London. It was in Holland Park Avenue, uh, which wasn't so accessible, even though everybody thinks London is the great, you know, you know, just hop on a bus and there you are. Those of us in the north know the truth of that, don't oh, we? Don't we just, yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, it was in London, and when I 
when I stopped being an Esperantist, if you like, to get married and have a family, and th- that was the, that was where it was. And when I got back, it had all shifted to Barliston. So um, I'm not exactly sure, apart from Horace Barks' influence and the fact that it was well established in the Wedgwood Memorial College in Stoke, um, I'm not quite sure why it all happened there. But of course, in Sheffield, um, there is an Esperanto place. And uh, I was present when that was renamed. I, I would just wonder whether it's got... I mean, right, you talk about Sheffield, we talk about South Yorkshire, you know, the People's Republic of. <laughs> and I just wonder whether there is some... You said it's it, there's no political will, but is there something with a very small P, something political and even socialist with a very small S about Esperanto? You know, ideas about international brotherhood, that sort of post-war workers, we will never be forced to go to war by our lords and masters again. And... When you talk about Esperanto, I sort of see, you know, the young pioneers of Hungary sitting in the middle of a forest clearing, um, you know, sort of round a a campfire, all determinedly learning and speaking Esperanto. It's got that sort of 1950s socialism feel about it. Guilty as charged, yes, it, it, it does have that kind of feel to it. There's a lot of idealism still hanging around. But with the younger people, well, I'm really pleased to say that uh, there's a, a foundation uh, called Norwich Jubilee Esperanto Foundation, N-O-J-E-F.com, I think, uh, where young people under 25 can apply for travel grants, especially if they, well, particularly if they're going abroad to use Esperanto to, well, just get around the world. Um, no strings attached in terms of, you know, you have to prove you've been on a study course or anything like that. You've just got to go and do this. And there is money available from bequests and things. Uh, so that I, I would really encourage any young people who've started it on Duolingo, for example, get into Noyef and, and get some money. Does it have a future? Yes, most definitely. Um, the library is getting stronger and stronger. There's a, a library in Barliston with over 30,000 volumes. Um, they're actually trying to clear out some of the clutter because they've got several copies of, of things that they don't really need several copies of. So Teach yourself Esperanto, as used by you in 1966. Absolutely. I don't know if it's the same copy. <laughs> but, um, yes, and they're, they're selling quite a lot of stuff off uh, in dribs and drabs on eBay. Um, so uh, look for Esperanto Association as an eBay user. Um, there is lots of stuff going on. Um, I've made a few films on, on YouTube to try and introduce English speakers to Esperanto. One of them I've called uh, Esperanto, building a, a language bridge. Because that's the idea these days, um, is not necessarily for it to be world-conquering as a universal language, but as a useful bridge between people who don't speak the same language or come from different language backgrounds. Um, and, oh, there's a, a fantastic... Um, video on YouTube, I must tell you about it. It's by a guy called Tim Morley, who's been featured on the Paul O'Grady show on television. Uh, And Tim says, it's like when you're trying to teach children a musical instrument, you don't start with a bassoon. You go with a recorder because their fingers are smaller and they can reach the holes on a recorder. And then gradually they can transition onto a bassoon, which is a much more tricky instrument. And learning languages is very much like that. You don't stick them in to do French straight away. You introduce them to the concepts of language learning with Esperanto and then move on to things like French and Spanish and German or Korean or Japanese or whatever. And I think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. Principles of of learning a language. It strikes me we haven't actually said much in Esperanto. I mean, I have made my sad effort at Chuvi Po, well, I can't even say it, (laughs) Povas, Audi, Kion, Esperanto, Sonas. Um, Can we hear what Esperanto sounds like? Could you just say a little something for us in Esperanto so that people can get a feel for the sound? Yeah, what would you like me to say? So this has put me on the spot. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'll say that. Pick something you know. (laughs) Yeah, um, Kion Vivolas Ke Mi Diru means what do you want me to say? And although it sounds a bit a bit odd, uh, the main thing there is me uh, kion vi volas. Volas is like volition, uh, willingness, if you like. So what do you want? Ke mi diru that I should say, or mi estas chitie en Sheffieldo en radio stazio kai mi parolas kun vi Jonathan. And I will leave you to translate that for yourself. That's the wonderful Ian Carter talking about his passion for Esperanto. If it's touched your life in any way, get in touch. Give me a call 01904 641 641 or drop me an email. It's jonathan at bbc.co.uk.